led me to speak to you about on this morning. I'm going to talk about understanding fear. Understanding fear. I had a recent experience as I was preparing for the sermon this week and just kind of reflecting on uh, uh, something that happened just a short time ago. I'll share it with you. Hopefully it'll paint a good picture for the message for this morning. A week ago, this last Friday, I had a meeting at the church 1.30 in the afternoon. And the reason I had that meeting is because a few days before that, I received a phone call uh, at the church from uh, one of our elected officials. They called the church and uh, wanted to know if they could schedule a meeting to speak with me. Happened to be one of our congressmen. And, and, and my first thought was that, that that would make sense to me if this particular congressman perhaps knew that I was the uh, president of our convention and uh, the, the many thousands of people that make up that convention. But I couldn't recall in my mind um, having met him on a personal basis. I've been in the room and heard him speak, but uh, I, I didn't recall us actually meeting. Uh, and, and so I kind of raised my eyebrow a bit and just kind of wondered to myself, well, what's this about? And so I had Tamara call him and, and say, go ahead and, and, and set up the meeting, but, uh, but let him know that uh, there will there'll be some more clergy uh, people that uh, uh, will, will be gathered. There was a very um, heated issue uh, in our nation that happened, I believe it was just the day before, uh, concerning some of the statements that the President of the United States had said. And, and so as the week went on leading up to uh, that Friday meeting here at the church, uh, more events began to unfold, uh, which really called into question uh, in my mind, as well as uh, several of, of the clergy and uh, no doubt lots of other people uh, uh, with regard to um, what appeared to be an inconsistency in what the congressman said as it relates to what the congressman did. Mm -hmm. So Friday rolled around and uh, uh, we gathered in, in, in the basement, it was myself and oh, it was maybe about uh, four or five other clergy, a couple of other uh, uh, leaders of our convention and uh, there was one uh, individual, just a concerned community activist and citizen. And congressman showed up. And I thanked him for calling me and uh, setting up time to talk and kind of introduced ourselves around the table. And I let him say what he had to say. And he said what he had to say and gave some wonderful remarks um, about various things and then he began to talk and after a few minutes we got to the nitty gritty and uh, the congressman uh, attempted to explain to us why on one day he said certain things and just a few days later his actions seem to be completely contrary to what he said. And he gave his explanation uh, uh, as to the reasons why he did what he did. And 
and, and perhaps they seem to have some, I don't know, logical sequence of events, at, at least in, in his mind, but the, the, the people in the room, uh, the, the clergy, uh, myself, uh, a couple of the other female leaders of our convention, and uh, the non-clergy uh, citizen who was there, uh, this church in the basement did, did not did not hesitate uh, to hold congressmen accountable for his inconsistency. Mm -hmm. And uh, we told him, regardless of your reasons why you did what you did, is the complete opposite of what you said. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was, to some degree, uh, it had its moments of, of intensity. And, and, and some of the, the, the rationale uh, that, that was explained uh, to me was far from acceptable. And I, I say all that to say, um, without saying the details, that that's really not the point. But I can share with you in the parking lot, <laughs> if you really want to know. Uh, the point is that despite his position, despite his influence, mm -hmm. Power, means, there was a point in time in which somebody needed to have no fear to speak the truth Come on, God. to power. Come on, God. And, and, and I can assure you, um, that that took place, that meeting last Friday here at the church. And, and, and the only way that we could stand up for righteousness, stand up for humanity, stand up for how you treat people publicly. Mm -hmm. The only way that could have happened to look that man of great power and position in the eye, say you were wrong. The only way that could have happened is there would have had to be no fear the consequences. Mm -hmm. and, 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 I, and I say that to say that as mm -hmm. children of the Most High God, God places us in circumstances for us to represent Him. Mm -hmm. That was free to His values. Right his truth, his righteousness. And sometimes those situations will come if we speak out at a price. God needs people, I'm convinced, who have no fear standing up speaking out on his behalf. Unfortunately, it is my belief that far too many times when those moments appear, instead of being bold, 
opening our mouths, speaking truthfully, mm -hmm. honestly, righteously, mm -hmm. lovingly. Right, right. Because of the thought of what might happen, mm -hmm. far too many people shrink back. Right. Mm -hmm. And the moment passes, mm -hmm. and nobody speaks for God. Mm -hmm. And so, Antioch, I need to tell you, mm -hmm. God wants us to not fear Amen. when it's time to speak out for him. Right, right. Even if it comes at a cost. Yeah. 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 And, and, and so, so the question is, and, 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 and I know that it happens because it's just the nature of life. Yeah. Uh, you don't even have to represent God to be put in circumstances where you're challenged to speak out in terms of what's right or what's wrong. And, but, but when it comes to, to as the Bible says, uh, being salt and light and, right. and shining in darkness and representing the kingdom and doing the work of the master, there is no doubt in my mind that some of the situations are a direct result of our claiming the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we will find ourselves even when that's not what we want to do, but because of whom we represent, there will come moments. Somebody's got to speak up. And Jesus says, do not fear. And, and, and so the text uh, in my opinion, is, is a very helpful one to us this morning, and uh, it, it helps us live out the command of Christ. And don't fear. You, you saw it, we read it four times in one paragraph. It said, have no fear in uh, verse, 20, well, verse 26, and then verse 28 says, do not fear. And then again in 28 it says fear. And then again in verse 31 it says fear not. And, and all of this stuff about fear. It, it seems to me that Jesus knows our tendencies. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it, it seems to me that he has a, a, a very good understanding of what we might do without him in a way that causes us not to represent him and the moment passes by and nobody speaks out for Christ. So, so how can you and I live Christian lives and live out the command of Jesus to not fear people? It, 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 it's, it's, it's a great question, and, and uh, the text is, 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 is going to help us. The, the, the first thing I see in the text is, is that if we're going to live out the command of Christ to not fear, we'll do it by understanding the context of fear. We, we've got to understand what, what, are, the, what are the circumstances that make fear a good option to act off of for some of us. Mm. What, 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 what goes on that, that uh, puts us in this position where we can either uh, allow fear to cause us to not speak up or step out, mm -hmm. uh, or we can give in to the fear and mm -hmm. be silent. What's, what's the context? In, in, in the text, there's an interesting thing that, 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 that shows up and, and, and when I got a full understanding of what was going on, it, it really opened my eyes from Christian perspective 
about what the Bible says about fear. Okay. In, in terms of the, the uh, understanding the context of fear, uh, uh, the, the first thing that I, that I noticed was, was, was the reality of, of following Jesus Christ. There, there's, a, there's a reality of following Jesus Christ that leads us to decide are we going to be afraid or not. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and here's, here's the reality. The reason that Jesus told the disciples to don't fear is, is because of what happened before he told them not to fear. If you, if you notice in your Bibles in the beginning of, of, of chapter 10, uh, really what takes place is that Jesus calls these 12 disciples follow him. Mm -hmm. and, and they were to follow him all the way up until Calvary. Mm -hmm. uh, they were to learn of him. Uh, Luke says that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. And they, they were learners of Jesus Christ uh, at his beck and call, uh, observing miracles and uh, fulfilling the assignments that Jesus gave them to develop uh, their faith uh, so that uh, when he would depart that they could carry on the mission. So he calls them unto himself. And, and then uh, right around verse 5, the Bible says, after he calls them, uh, verse 5 says, these 12 Jesus sent out. And, and Get closer to this reality. Uh, he calls the disciples. Uh, then he sends them out. And then uh, if you look down uh, uh, in verse 16, uh, you'll, you'll find the, the, the reality. <laughs> Chapter 10, verse 16 says these words. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Here's the reality of following, following Christ. Jesus sent them into trouble. Right. Okay. That's the reality. Mm -hmm. You want to know why he repeated, don't fear, don't fear, don't fear? The reason is because if you're following Jesus, he just might send you into trouble. No, nowhere uh, do I read uh, in this particular passage where Jesus asked for volunteers. Uh, 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 I read in the Old Testament uh, and in Isaiah uh, where God said, whom shall we send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I, O Lord, send me, I'll go. Uh, but, but in this passage, when, when there's a tough assignment. He did not ask for volunteers. He sent them into trouble. Okay. Here, here's, here's the deal, Antioch. If the gospel is going to reach the world, somebody's going to get a tough job. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. If we're not going to just stay in our holy huddle, if, if we're going to take the gospel and, and if, if, we're gonna, if we're going to do our best to allow God to use us, that uh, his kingdom in heaven would appear on earth until such time that he would come, if we're going to share the gospel, if we're going to make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost and teach them to observe uh, all things whatsoever he commanded, if we're going to do that, somebody going to get a tough assignment. Right. And Jesus just might send you into trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Without asking if you want to. Right. 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 That's, that's a part of the context of understanding fear. It, it, it's, it's, it's because if we're going to be followers, we got to follow. Mm -hmm. right. 
And if we're followers, that means we're not the leaders. There's a sender and there are goers. And we need to know who's who. All right. Jesus is the sender. Mm -hmm. We are the goers. Mm -hmm. And the text says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's the context. That's, that's part of the context. The reality of following Christ and, and then the reality of following Christ uh, is followed up the certainty of persecution. Mm -hmm. Not only did Jesus tell them, I'm sending you into trouble, but Jesus guaranteed that you're going to get in trouble mm -hmm. if you're following me. If you say what I say. If you do what I tell you to do, uh, uh, I'm going to send you into difficult situations at times, and you will not always escape difficulty. Mm -hmm. He's preparing them in advance for what they're going to experience, perhaps for the very first time as followers of Christ. And they are getting a real life lesson as to what it means to really claim the name of Jesus. It, it, it means that Jesus gives out the assignments. I, I know uh, Antioch, uh, that's not always desirable. And sometimes we may look at the assignment that the Lord gives us and we might say, I don't want to do that. But there's a sender, and there are goers. He's the sender, we're the goers. That's the reality. It's followed up by the certainty of persecution. Notice what the text says. Chapter 10, verse 17. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you. That's a physical whipping with uh, long strips of cord with stuff on the end and it's a, it's a literal physical beating. It's more than just being delivered over into jail. Their bodies would suffer damage because Jesus sent them out. It's what the Bible says. They'll flog you in their synagogues and you'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. the, the, the context of fear is real. It is not make-believe. It is not in your head. Sometimes he sends you into trouble so that you can represent him in difficult places. And sometimes you're going to get hurt. Sometimes you're going to get offended. Sometimes you're going to get arrested. Sometimes you're going to get whipped and beaten. Is what the text says. And Jesus is telling them, this is what awaits you. And then he goes on to say, in verse 21, brother will deliver brother over to death and father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death for my name's sake and you will be hated the Bible says by all for my name's sake but one who endures to the end will be saved Drop down verse 24, it says, The disciple is not above his teacher, nor servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and servant like his master. 
They have called the master of the house Beelzebub. How much more mm -hmm. will they malign those of his household? And Jesus is telling them before sending them out the reason that you're going to be persecuted is because you're with me. That's how they treat me. And I'm sending you to represent me, but because you're representing me and they hate me, they're going to hate you as soon as you represent him. That was preaching. As soon as you live the life, as soon as you open your mouth, they're going to say, oh, that's him, and we hate him, so we're going to hate you too. Right, right. And that's the context of fear. Mm -hmm. It is the desire to not experience the consequences that are associated with being connected to Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's when he sends you out for his namesake and gives you difficult assignments to live the life, to open up your mouth. He's saying, and when you do, don't always expect for things to go well. It's going to cost you sooner or later to represent Jesus Christ. And there's no escaping if you ain't scared. Mm. There's no getting around the persecution if you ain't scared. There, 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 there's no uh, uh, can I speak out for you but can you hold back on the on the flogging? Mm -hmm. I, I'll live for you but can you just dial down mm -hmm. the haters? I'll speak out for you, but 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 can't I just live in peace? And and, and, and you can't have your cake and right, eat it too. Right. You're either gonna live out, you're either gonna speak out, or you're gonna respond in fear. And Jesus gives the context, then he says, have no fear. I know what I'm doing. I know who you are. I called you. I know where you're going. I'm sending you. I know what's going to happen because I done told you. Yeah. But don't be afraid. Yeah. 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 When you have opportunity for my name's sake to speak out for me, to live for me, to stand up for me, it's going to cost you, but do not fear. That's the context of fear. But, but, but then the, the, the text helps us to deal with understanding the dimensions of fear. But now that we understand the context, what, what, what's going to happen that would cause fear to be an option is because Jesus sent you. Mm -hmm. And when you do what he told you to do, it's going to cost you. And that's the context. But then, but then there, there, there's the understanding of the dimensions of fear. And, and, and this was an amazing discovery of digging out the treasures in the word of God. That was preaching. The text says, in verse 26, have no fear, for nothing that is covered will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the house steps. Here's the, here's the dimensions. It's, it's right in verse 28. Do not fear those who, can, who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body into hell. Four times fear is used in the text. Verse 26, verse 28, again in verse 28, and in verse 31. Four times where fear is used. Three times it says, don't do it. Don't have any of it. 
Fear not. And one time it says, do fear. Did y'all see that in the text? Verse 26, have no fear. Beginning of verse 28, do not fear. Uh, verse 31, fear not. All of those seem to be the type of fear that Jesus is saying don't have. But at the end of verse 28, it says, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body into hell. And he's just saying, don't have this fear. Do have that fear. Mm -hmm. Y'all see that in the text? Yeah. All you got to do is read it for yourself. It's in there, I promise you. And, 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 and we made it an amazing discovery on Bible study one day, uh, Wednesday when we studied this passage, that apparently there is a good fear mm -hmm. and a bad fear. Mm -hmm. right, right. Otherwise, he wouldn't say, don't have this fear, don't fear, don't fear, but do fear. Right, and, right. and then I thought, huh, why would he say, don't do something, and then say, do the same thing that he said, don't do, right. three times, and he said, do it one time, something's got to be up. Mm -hmm. And I discovered the dimensions of fear. Two kinds. The bad fear to avoid, and there's a good fear to embrace. Mm -hmm. the, the, the bad fear, the the fear that he says in verse 31 and, and verse 26 and the, the beginning of verse 28, the, 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 the bad fear uh, has to do with our response to people that would cause us to shrink away from doing what God said. And Jesus said, don't do that. That's, that's the bad fear. And, and he says it in relation to the people who are going to persecute them. Mm -hmm. He says it to the people that are going to throw them in prison. He says it in reference to the people that just might take their lives. Uh, he says in verse 28, have no fear of them. Beginning of verse 28, do not fear those. And he's talking about don't shrink back because of the people that are opposing you, even though they just might persecute you. That's the negative fear. And as irrational as that might sound, it's spiritual and it's biblical. Just because they can cause you harm doesn't mean you need to be afraid and not speak out. Mm -hmm. That's the message that Jesus is giving. But then there's a good fear. He says, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body into hell. This, this, this fear is not about a shrinking away and not doing something because you don't want the consequences, the, the intimidation factor. This, this fear where he said, rather do fear, that this has got to do with reverence and respect for God. And he's saying, don't worry about them. Focus on me. Take me seriously. Lift me up. Revere me. Honor me. Respect me. Place more value in me than you do them. Because they can only do so much. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, don't, don't fear them. Uh, if they take your life, ain't nothing else they can take. Because they can't touch your soul. Jesus said, respect me. Because I can take you out and I can save your soul. Right. Put me first. Right, right. And so he talks about understanding the context of fear. And then he talks about 
uh, the dimensions of fear, the good fear and the bad fear. And, and then finally, uh, uh, really, the, the, the text is really flooded with building our resistance to fear. How, how can you and I build up a resistance such when the consequences are in our face mm -hmm. that we don't shrink back? All right. Mm -hmm. That when it's our moment to stand, our moment to speak out, our moment to live for Christ, that we don't mm -hmm. hide in the back. Mm -hmm. Let somebody else do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Keep our mouths shut mm -hmm. and let the moment pass. How, how can we be bold? How can we put God above what men can do? It's right in the text. I, I'm going to share a few of those things and then we'll shut it down. How, how do we build our resistance to fear? We, we do it, first of all, by standing on the promises of Jesus. That, that's, that's how we don't give in to fear. By standing on the promises of Jesus. And there's some promises in this text that if the disciples would hold on to them, it would give them strength and courage, and they wouldn't shrink away. What, what are the promises in the text? Je right. Jesus says uh, in the text, nothing that is covered that will not be revealed. That's a promise. <laughs> or hidden that will not be known. That's a promise. Jesus is saying, if you just hold on, everything is going to be made known. All the intimidation, all of the ridicule, all of the false accusations that come as a result for living for Christ, all the consequences that will have to be paid because they... Nothing that's covered up now and the end is going to be uncovered all of the secrets all of the conspiracies all of the corruption all of the manipulation all of the persecution that's been swept under the rug Jesus said it's coming to the light don't be scared stand on his promises it's going to happen in due time. Mm -hmm. That's how you build your resistance to fear. Standing on the promises mm -hmm. of Jesus. Second thing in the text, by following the commands of Jesus. Yeah, yeah you need to stand on his promises that it's going to happen. But in the meantime, you need to do what Jesus said, do. Right. And he said in verse 27, say what I tell you to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. Mm -hmm. And what you hear whisper, proclaim on the house steps. Do what I say. The recipe for fear is obedience. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. What Jesus tells you to say, say it. Don't hold back if you're representing him. Doesn't matter what people may do. Trust his promises. Do what he says. How do you do it? By respecting the power of Jesus. First, standing on the promises of Jesus. Second, following the commands of Jesus. Third, respecting the power of Jesus. And, and, and he says those persecutors can only do so much. They can only go so far. They can take your life, but they've got limited power. 
But Jesus, he is power, has no limitations. There's nothing he can do. If he wants it to stop, it's going to stop. If he wants it to continue, it's going to continue. Respect the power of Jesus. Rather, fear him who has the power to kill body and soul. How do you overcome fear? Standing on the promises of Jesus. Following the commands of Jesus. Respecting the power of Jesus. Trusting the evaluation of Jesus. Jesus did some calculations and he added it all up and he came to a conclusion and his conclusion is this. You are of great value to him. But that's why you don't have to fear. It's because of how much God thinks about yeah. you. Such that he gives his toughest assignments to his best people. Mm -hmm. the, the Bible says the sparrow and the, and, and the penny, two of the most insignificant things uh, that they think of in their day. Uh, Jesus knows all about them. And he knows even more about you. Mm -hmm. he, he said he knows hairs on your head. Mm -hmm. What else does he know? The trouble he sent you into. Mm -hmm. What else does he know? Uh, the persecution that you're about to endure. And he thinks so much of you that he would give his toughest assignments to his best people and he values you so mm. much. He says you are of so much more value. Yes. And, and, and if you haven't heard it today, hear it now. God loves you mm. so much that he would not allow anything to happen that he was not privy to that he didn't either cause or allow. Trust me, he's watching. Because he cares for you. Yeah. He, even when you stand up for him and take the heat, he values you. He said it in his word. How do, you, how do you avoid fear? Standing on the promises of Jesus. Following the commands of Jesus. Respecting the power of Jesus. Trust in the evaluation of Jesus, of how valuable you are. And, and then finally, by confessing relationship with Jesus. Simply making it known whose side mm -hmm. you're on. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that that meeting we had with the with the congressman, and uh, I wasn't about this side of the aisle or that side of the aisle. I was representing Jesus. Yeah. Made it known without reservation. I'm owning him because he said this how to treat people. And, and Jesus says plainly in the text that. Everyone who acknowledges or confesses relationship with me, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. You can take that to the bank. If you open up your mouth and you say, I'm on the Lord's high, knowing you about to be in hot water, Jesus is watching. And if you own him and take hot water for him now, when it's time for him to speak up to the yeah, Father, he's going to yeah. call your name and say, this one right here took it for the team. Yeah, yeah. This one right here confessed me and they suffered. And I want you to know, Father, take care of them because they suffered for me. Yeah. That, that's, that's how you don't give in to fear, simply by confessing relationship with him openly.
got all kind of things going on now about people openly confessing stuff. And this folk, this person out the closet and this person out the closet and they're openly confessing what was in the closet and, and they got campaigns and political strategies and all this kind of stuff. But when it comes to Jesus, the people of God need to confess him openly, publicly, without fear of any man. Because Jesus sent us. But if you don't, if you don't, Jesus says, whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. And I read it and I thought, ooh, that's tight. And I had to read it again. Whoever acknowledges me, I'll acknowledge him. But whoever denies me, I'll deny him. And I'm thinking, why in the world would Jesus say that? What, what, is, what is the rationale behind the heart and mind of our Savior such that he would say, uh, if you do it right, it's going to go well for you. If you don't do it wrong, it's not going to... And, and then, then I thought about my parents. <laughs> uh, uh, when when, when uh, 5 o'clock was approaching and they were on their way home from work, mm -hmm. if things were done, right, right. it went well. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And when things were not done, mm -hmm. there were consequences. <laughs> And repercussions. <laughs> and it, it served in my uh, lack of internalizing the need to keep the house tidy. It provided some external motivation <laughs> until such time that I wanted to do the right thing right, right. because it was right. Yeah. I had not arrived at that point where I did what was right because it was right. Uh -huh. So I needed a little push. Right, right. And the push was if you get it done, things will go well. If you don't get it done, mm -hmm. things will not. And, and, and I think sometimes in the continuum of the maturity of our faith, sometimes we do the right thing because it's right. But sometimes when our faith is not matured to that level, we need a push. Right, right. <laughs> and the push is if you acknowledge me, I'll acknowledge you. Mm -hmm. If you don't acknowledge me, mm -hmm. I won't acknowledge you. And all I think that is, is until our faith develops, mm -hmm. till we do the right thing because it's the right thing, every now and then God needs. He needs to push us. And so anyhow, I tell you today, when it comes to living for Jesus, when it comes to speaking up on behalf of Jesus, that we need to live without fear of people. We need to live without fear of positions. Mm -hmm. We need to live without fear of power. We need to live without fear of persecution. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we represent the king. And the king is watching. We represent Jesus. The one who called us. The one who sent us. The one 
who has prepared us for what we're going to face mm -hmm. when we live for him. We represent Jesus. Mm -hmm. The one who died on Calvary's cross. Mm -hmm. The one who stayed in the grave Friday, Saturday, the one who on early Sunday morning mm -hmm. rose from the dead with all power. We represent Jesus, yes, yes. the one who was given a name hmm. that is above every name. Yeah. We represent Jesus, oh, yeah. the one whom the Bible says that at that name, mm. every knee mm. should bow and every tongue yeah. should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord he is the one that we represent. Mm -hmm. And because we represent him, he said, do not fear. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Let, let's take a moment Amen. and kind of digest what God has said to us today. I, I, I want to 